I'm Robert Grant, and this is The Codex. In 2018, I published a paper titled The Accurate and Infinite Prediction of Prime Numbers Using a Novel Quasi-Prime Methodology. In this paper, I was able to figure out how to predict prime numbers, something that I had learned back in grade school was an impossibility. The way that I came to it was by figuring out that numbers actually operate in spirals of 24 repeating over and over and over again. As I looked at numbers in 24, I noticed also that the Fibonacci pattern also repeats when you look at it in digital root mathematics, collapsing every number down to single digits. For example, 27 would be two plus seven equals nine. In looking at it this way, I noticed that all the Fibonacci numbers would repeat themselves every 24 cycles. So I thought there must actually be something that's very fundamental to 24. So as I wondered what that relationship to 24 might actually be, I couldn't also help but think about the famous words of the late great physicist Stephen Hawking, who posited that in order for us to have a unified physics model for the universe, that we would have to also solve prior to that time the relationship between mathematical constants like pi and the golden number phi, and many others. As I thought about that, I also couldn't help but think about the relationship to music. Now, mathematicians throughout history have very often also been musicians. Pythagoras is probably the first great example of that. Pythagoras taught us that math and music are actually one. What Pythagoras noticed was that if he continued to play with strings and cut a string down small enough, he could actually see the relationship, and if he always did it in halves, that would cause doubling and halving of octaves infinitely, all the way up until we could no longer hear sound anymore. At a certain stage, at about 20,000 cycles per second, human beings can't hear any more the notes that go above that, but they actually continue to go all the way up. This was fascinating to me this concept of music and math being the same thing. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be possible to relate musical notes to prime numbers? And if I could relate musical notes to prime numbers, would I not then also be able to relate musical notes to mathematical constants and see what those relationships might actually yield for us? So through that process, I did exactly that. The seminal effort was really tied to the simple concept of what if I dropped two pebbles into a still pond? What happens with the waves that overlap each other? And as they crash into each other, they create these intersections. And as these intersections basically create wave interferences within themselves, both constructive and destructive interference patterns emerge. I posited then also that possibly where those waves are intersecting is exactly relational to a modular arithmetic or a view in spirality of the number 24. And it turned out to be correct. 24 is a basic pattern that represents both a sine and cosine relationship. Now you might remember back in school, we all studied sine and cosine relationships in both geometry and trigonometry. I started thinking about this a little bit more deeply and as I got deeper and deeper into it, I realized that this is just a beautiful language. This language that we can see in the form of geometry and really that geometry is nothing more than just the sound that we enjoy with our eyes. I learned more and more about this relationship of these musical notes and how what I've been seeing with my eyes my entire life could actually even be represented is just wave patterns of sound. Now 24, you could break it into two pieces and both sides would be 12. And this is why we have 12 notes in each octave. And as we double an octave, then of course 24 goes to 48 by doubling it again, and so on. So here again, the entire prime number pattern repeats itself infinitely 
through a musical representation in such a beautiful way. One other aspect of this as well is that the sound that we listen to and the musical notes we listen to are actually directly related to the geometries. In fact, the geometries that underlie those sounds might actually help us to understand more about how to precisely tune those sounds to our greatest benefit. And that's one of the things that's been a long-term dream of mine, that one day I would be able to figure out how to tune our DNA, like keys on a piano keyboard, with very high precision, because I believe that the healing mechanisms will not be pharmacologic in the future, but rather sound-based. Because sound is able to penetrate through our bodies, through all of our cells. And if we could figure out how to precisely tune it, might that not have a big impact on our biology and our own wellness and well-being? You know, Leonardo da Vinci also faced this similar challenge. Right in the Vitruvian Man, most people don't notice that there's actually a page number written in the upper right-hand corner of the Vitruvian Man, which is kind of bizarre because, first of all, it's not written backwards in mirrored text. If you notice, you'll see in the upper right-hand corner, it looks to be right adjacent to a fold line, as if it's a page in a book. There's also a backwards mirrored text of the letter B, that's tail is pointing straight to a number. Now that number, as we get close up on it, is actually 126. Now this was something that was really sort of enigmatic for me when I first saw it, because first of all, was the Vitruvian Man part of a book? Not really. It was a loose leaf representation of, you know, one of his sketches. But why would he write the number 126 as if it's a page number and then point to it with a backwards letter B? Well, I had to go even further into understanding what da Vinci might be referring to. And it takes you all the way back to around the fourth century BC, where Plato is actually speaking to the Greek Senate at a time of great unrest in his country of Greece. The unrest was due to the great plague of Athens that swept through the city in 430 BC during the Peloponnesian War that claimed nearly 100,000 lives. In an attempt to stop the spread of the plague, leaders in Greece sought the help of famed philosopher Plato. After Plato failed to find a solution, they consulted the Oracle of Delphi, who told them, The simple solution is, you must double the size of the altar to the sun god Apollo, and if you can perfectly double its volume, then the plague will dissipate. In short, the ancient Greeks had to solve the mathematical problem of doubling the volume of a cube. The answer turns out to be the cubed root of two, which is approximately 1.26. Now this has a very, very important relationship to music itself. Pythagoras had taught us that in order to form a musical scale, we can do it with a perfect fifth. And the perfect fifth relationship is three over two. So in terms of music, if you know music well, you could say that a perfect fifth relationship for the note C at middle C would become a G note. From this, you can figure out how to populate a lot of the scale. But in order to complete an entire scale, you must also include something called a major third. Now the major third is a mathematical interval relationship that was defined by Pythagoras as being five over four, or 1.25. The challenge is though, is that if you start to populate a scale using the interval that Pythagoras had actually outlined in something called just tuning, starting with 432 hertz as your A note, after a while, when you start 
taking those intervals of three over two to populate the next perfect fifth, as well as the major third relationship of five over four, you find a discrepancy emerges. It becomes impossible to actually double the octave through the major third. So this is a real challenge. Musically, Pythagoras taught us, well, we can make up for this challenge by replacing this method of just tuning with another approach that uses something called a Pythagorean comma, which sort of makes up for this slight difference that in octave doubling creates this discrepancy that doesn't allow you to double the octave. But the problem is no different than the solution that had to be found during the plague in ancient Greece. I had the idea to replace the 1.25 using just tuning with 1.26 instead, the cube root of two. Now in this context, we actually see the symmetry that nature can apply of the perfect fifth, which is three, o three over two, as well as a new approach to a major third using the cube root of two. So as we get deeper into this, we can now see that using this new tuning approach, which I decided to name precise temperament tuning, we can find that every note in this context, starting from 432 hertz, will also have a digital sum of nine without exception. But unlike most tuning standards that end at a, an approach that would kind of have a whole number value, this goes into fractional representations. Equal temperament tuning does as well, but this is very different because even the fractional decimal extension, even every one of those numbers in every three digits will sum to the number nine. This happens naturally as a consequence of simply replacing the cube root of two, 1.26, for the prior 1.25, five over four major third relationship. This is an extraordinarily controversial topic amongst the musical community. Prior to 1939, there was no tuning standard. In 1939, an international organization decided to put together a global tuning standard. It was headed by John D. Rockefeller and his organization. At that time, they decided that although many people around the globe were using different tuning standards, they wanted to standardize it to a simple 440 hertz. Now, the challenge with that was that if we add up four plus four plus zero, does it equal nine? It must answer at nine. If not, it will not have a perfect geometric correspondence. And as I said, geometry is simply the music that we listen to with our eyes and our sight. Maybe when music has been written by the likes of Bach and Verdi and Mozart, they intended to have certain notes have certain emotional qualities and texture and context come along with them. There's a certain quality that is intended to provide a contrast. Does our current equal temperament system provide us with that degree of contrast reference? And I don't believe it does.